Hello, I'm Curtis Hartshorn. Welcome to the 10th and final lesson of the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. Man, I can't hardly believe that we're already at the last lesson. It's been a, a joyful journey for me. I hope it has for you as well. In this class, we're going to be looking at obeying the plain gospel. We're going to be answering the second part of our title, the plain gospel, what do we do with it? What are we supposed to do with it? If you get out your Bible, you can be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be there in a moment. We're going to answer three questions in this class. And if you've been paying attention to the first nine lessons, you already know the answers to these three questions because I've answered them uh, somewhat. But we're going to look in detail at, number one, what is the gospel? Number two, what do we do with the gospel? And three, how do we obey the gospel? Again, you probably know the answers to those questions, but we're going to walk through it and kind of culminate, bring everything that we've, we've studied together to the main point. So let's answer that first question. What is the gospel? Well, number one, the gospel is the good news of salvation for everyone through Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Starting in verse 1, it says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. So this gospel, what is the gospel? Well, it's one that, that Paul had already preached to them, number two. He'd already preached to the Corinthians the gospel. So now he's reminding them, I want to make known to you, that's another way of saying, I want to remind you about this gospel, the one I preached, the one you received, the one on which you stand. So there's no question which gospel he's talking about. There's really only one. It's that gospel I want to remind you about. Point number three, there is much to the gospel. But what is of first importance, and that's what he says, this is of first importance, verse three, is that Christ died, he was buried, and he was raised. And so in answer to our question, what is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. Now in the last class, I, I made the point that there is more to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ when it comes to the gospel. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about teaching an unbeliever. Somebody who maybe doesn't even hardly know the Bible. What do they need to know about the gospel? They need to know that the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the core. We can instruct them on the rest later on. But for all intent and purposes, when we're teaching somebody how to become a Christian, and we show them this passage, what is the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second question, B, what do we do with the gospel? I'm going to show you four passages that all say basically the same thing, answering the question, what do we do with the gospel? Here's the first one. Number one, hearing the good news will not result in entering God's rest until we obey it. In other words, until we obey the good news. We're going to look at Hebrews at a passage we have not been to yet in this study. In Hebrews chapter 4, and the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews, Jews, who were thinking about leaving Christianity and going back to their old Jewish ways. And so it's written to show what the old covenant had, but how the new covenant is superior, that the Old Testament really was just a shadow of the new. And so there's a lot of going back and forth between the Old and the New Testament. We're going to see that in this passage that we're going to look at in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 4. For he said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, 
In this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. When the Hebrew writer says, it says somewhere, he's probably being facetious. Everybody knows that's Genesis 2 and verse 2, which says God rested on the seventh day from all his work. We've read the, the creation account. God created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. But then he quotes Psalms 95 verse 11 in the next verse, verse 5, they shall not enter my rest. Well, who was it that didn't enter the rest? He answers that question in verse 6. He says, it remains for some, those who formerly had the good news. And the word good news is yongaliso. It's the word gospel. It's exactly the same thing. Good news, gospel. Those who had the gospel preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. So in other words, they heard the gospel, but it didn't save them because they didn't obey it. This gospel, this good news, will not result in entering God's rest until it is obeyed. And even though he's using an old covenant concept here in verses from Genesis and Psalms, he's tying it in with, he's going to go on and say, basically, we're in the same situation. We don't enter into the rest of God until we obey the gospel. There's the first verse. Let's look at the second one, number two. If we truly believe the gospel, we will heed its good news. Now, this is Romans chapter 10, and we have looked at this one before in our our Romans uh, lesson. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For uh, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Here he's saying that they, they needed to hear and they need to have the gospel preached to them. And so God sent preachers and, and then he says, but in verse 16, they did not all heed the good news. So they heard the gospel. Again, it's the same word, euangeliso in the Greek. The good news, the gospel. They heard this gospel, but they did not heed the gospel. What is Heed. Well, the Greek word is a compound of two words. It's, it's hupakuo, and hupo is the word for under, and akuo is the word to hear. So it means to hear under, or to hear as if a subordinate were hearing, to hear the way a, a slave would listen to his master. It's listening with the intent of obedience, and by implication, to conform or to go along with, to, to obey or hearken a command of one who is an authority. And so they didn't heed, in other words, they didn't obey the good news, the gospel. So there's two passages so far that say we need to obey the gospel. Let's look at the third one, number three. Those who don't obey the gospel will pay the penalty of everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians, of course, we just looked at this one in the class before, but let's visit it again. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. God is dealing out retribution. Verse 9 talks about this the separation from God, this eternal destruction. 
a destruction that is eternal, that never ends. That's obviously talking about hell. If I want to escape hell, this everlasting destruction, I need to make sure I obey the gospel because those who don't know God and those who don't obey God suffer retribution. Three passages that talk about obeying the gospel. Let's look at a fourth. This one is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Point number four, one must obey the gospel in order to be part of the household, the family of God. Now, this is one we have not looked at yet in our study series, but uh, goes along really well and is another case in point where we are told that we need to obey the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 4, and all we need is verse 17. It says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So here's another passage that says we need to obey the gospel of God. And we need to do that if we want to be in the household, in the family of God. Uh, some translations say household, some say family. That's what a household is. It's a family. I have a, an illustration here. I have a, a bull, a very beautiful bull. And let's let this represent the household, the family of God. Now this verse says that it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Those who are inside here, they are in the family of God. And he says if it begins with us, those in the household of God, what about those who don't obey the gospel? So those who don't obey the gospel are not in the family of God. That's what the Bible says. We may wish they were in the family of God. We may treat them like they're in the family of God, and we really shouldn't do that. But they're not in the family of God until they obey the gospel. As long as they don't obey the gospel, they're not in the family of God. So there's four key verses in our New Testament that explain what we do with the gospel. What we do is we obey it. So we've answered what is the gospel. We've answered what do we do with the gospel. Let's talk about the third question, C. How do we obey the gospel? Well, number one, a person must die to their sins before they can be buried. Romans chapter 6 Another passage that we have looked at before, but let's visit it again. Romans chapter 6. We're in context. Paul is talking to the Romans, both Jews and Gentiles in the same church, and he's explaining to them in chapter 5 that if they are, have transgressed many times, there is much grace to cover them. Of course, the the Jew is legalistic, and he would say, well, Paul, should we, should we sin more so we get more grace? And even before they ask that question, he goes there in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so the grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. How do we obey the gospel? Well, the first thing that we do is we die. We die to sin. That's what he says in verse 2. We died to sin. Not died from sin. If you die from sin, that means sin kills you. Dying to sin means I'm pushing it away. I want nothing to do with sin. It does not mean becoming perfect. It means to be of a mindset that I am repenting of my sin. That's another word we learn from Acts chapter 2, verse 38. To repent means to turn away from. I'm repenting. I'm putting my sin away. And we need to do that before we get buried. I'm going to show you that burial is baptism. Before we baptize somebody... Make sure they die to their sin. A person needs to die to their sin first and then get buried in baptism. Very important that they do that. Sometimes we baptize somebody and say, oh, I know they got a bunch of sins, but they'll take care of that later. That's really not the biblical pattern. 
Encourage your person that wants to be baptized when they say, I, I really want to be baptized. Well, die to your sins. Have you died to your sins? And if they have, great. But if they haven't, they need to do that first. Secondly, just as Jesus was buried, we too are buried in baptism. That's verse 4. Therefore, having been buried with Him through baptism into death, we are buried just like Jesus went into the, the tomb, into the grave. We are buried when we're immersed in water. And that's what baptisma means. It means to immerse. When we are immersed in the waters of baptism, we are showing that we have already died. You shouldn't, again, you shouldn't bury somebody if they're still alive. That's cruel. When somebody dies, then we bury them in baptism. Only after that, point number three, only after baptism is a person raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism is the point where we are dying our sins and we're buried, but we don't get raised until after we're buried. The order here is very important. You don't change the order because then you've changed the gospel. And there are religious groups out there that change it. And they say, well, you know, you could die to your sins and, uh, and uh, then, we'll, then you're saved. And later, if you want to get buried, if you want to get baptized, well, that's, that's backwards. Or people say, well, when you're a, a baby, you get uh, baptized and then you're saved. And then later you go through this time where you, you die your sins. No, no. Death comes first, then the burial, and then the resurrection. Just like with Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. Then he was resurrected. In the same way, in our old life, we die to our sins and we die to self. Then we're buried in the waters of baptism with Christ. Then and only then are we raised to walk in newness of life. This is how we obey the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. How do we obey the gospel? We do the same thing. We die to sin. We're buried with, in baptism. We're raised to walk in newness of life. That, pure and simple, is the gospel. And that is how we obey the gospel. That's all I have to share with you. I hope that this course has been a blessing to you. Again, I've just enjoyed so much studying this and presenting it, do me a favor, please. Would you send me an email at curtis at bibletalk.tv or you can mail a letter if, if you prefer. Just send it to bibletalk.tv and I'll get that. But I would really love to hear from every single student who completes these 10 lessons. I would just like to know just your, your input or just write to me and say, hey, and I finished the class. Uh, here's what I thought about it. That would be, mean so much to me, and I promise I will respond to every letter and every email that I received. And then also, let me encourage you, be sure you check out some other wonderful classes and sermons. Uh, we have so many great resources here at Bible Talk on our website. Uh, if you enjoyed this class, you will enjoy those others as well. Until next time, I'm Curtis Hartshorn. Uh, God bless you. Keep preaching the gospel. We'll see you next time.